In the midst of constant commotion in the healthcare industry, one unified voice rises above the rest, a beacon bent on banishing biofilm. They are sterile processing professionals who clean and sterilize their way to improved outcomes, and their patient safety victories often go unseen. This is Beyond Clean, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are pushing the sterile processing industry forward. Join us every week as we give voice to that global force fighting dirty all around the world. It's time to go beyond clean. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Michael Matthews, manager of Central Sterile at Baptist Health in Arkansas. Mike is a rising star in the sterile processing industry who has taken a particular interest in regards to compensation and education requirements for frontline technicians. And Hank, I'm really excited about this one. I know we're going to be talking about sterile processing compensation education and partnering with your infection control professionals in the institution. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you got to know Mike before we go to the interview and sort of why you selected him as the first guest for our new show. Well, so Mike and I actually go back uh, a good ways. We started in the same sterile processing department in Louisville, Kentucky, um, a good eight or nine years ago. And uh, through that time, we uh, we grew into leaders in our own right uh, across the country from each other. But he has continued to just bring a fantastic perspective to some of the challenges and, and issues that are uh, are hot today that are debated and discussed in our big national meetings. Uh, so I'm very excited to talk to him, and I know it's going to be a great discussion. Yeah, definitely will, and I'm ex- I'm excited to kick off our first episode of Beyond Clean. As a reminder, you can subscribe to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We can also be heard on the Sterile Education app, available on iTunes and Android. Follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info, Facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast, LinkedIn.com slash Company slash Beyond Clean, and Instagram, Beyond Clean Podcast. Find our videos, including Fighting Dirty with Hank Balch, Real Talk with Bob Mars, and Beyond the Headlines with Mike Matthews at YouTube.com slash Beyond Clean. Beyond Clean offers social media and podcast consulting for vendors and survey preparation and remote consulting services for hospitals, surgery centers, and clinics. Email info at beyondclean.net for more information. Finally, Beyond Clean has moved to a new format for issuing CE credits for our podcast. We will be releasing Season 1 episodes between now and Season 7, which will air in the new year. This means that all six episodes will be certified in a single package with one quiz and certificate. Be sure to visit our website at beyondclean.net to take the quiz once Season 7 begins airing in January. We'll be right back after a short break. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Michael Matthews, manager of Central Sterile at Baptist Health in Arkansas. Mike, really appreciate you coming on for us in our inaugural show of Beyond Clean. Oh, thanks, man. It's uh, my pleasure. It's really exciting to be a part of this. Well, Hank, I know you know Michael pretty well, and I guess we're going to call you Mike, but... uh, you know him pretty well. I'll let you kind of start it off. I think we wanted to go and kick it off talking a little bit about uh, partnering with infection control and and really how that can help the initiatives for the sterile processing department and the organization. That's great. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, so, Mike, you get down to Arkansas as a new central sterile manager. You walk into your facility. What are your thoughts in relation to the importance that infection control is going to play in how you manage your department, and how do you how do you first get involved with that collaborative uh, agreement and relationship to work together? Sure. So I had a really nice advantage uh, coming into my first management job. Uh, my infection preventionist uh, at Conway Regional, which is the first hospital I managed in this area, um, she actually took the initiative to come to me. And honestly, at the time, I had not even you know, really thought about 
having that avenue as a resource. And she just uh, initially came to me and said, hey, let's uh, let's set up a meeting once a month, uh, you know, 30 minutes long where we can just discuss uh, instrument reprocessing, where we're at, what are our challenges, what do we need to be focusing on, all those sorts of things. And honestly, you know, I'd love to say that I just, I just you know, miraculously came up with the idea myself, but it really wasn't like that at all. The infection preventionist uh, took the time to, uh, bridge that gap for me, and then progressively, I can begin to solve the immense uh, advantages of that that professional relationship. Uh, and interestingly, you know, I said that was at my my first uh, hospital I managed. About a year later, I actually moved hospitals to a, a new hospital that was being built, and they had a different infection preventionist, and I took sort of that relationship uh, with me and then tried to set up, you know, something new with the, the next inf- uh, infection prevention that I'd be working with. And, uh, you know, that, that started off that relationship really well. And then that particular IP uh, got a different job and moved on. And the new hospital went back and recruited my old IP that I originally had. So I'm actually at a new hospital working with the IP that I initially worked with in the first place. Uh, so we just kind of picked up that same monthly meeting, and it's kind of the same thing that we've always been doing. We're almost like a one-two team. Well, so dig in a little bit to those monthly meetings for us. What are you talking about? Who's setting the agenda? What are you walking away with um, at the end of it? Sure. So, you know, initially uh, – the IP, you know, one thing you'll know, notice about IPs when you talk to them is they're very, they, they tend to be very, you know, regulatory focused. And so she wanted to talk about, you know, how are we being compliant with, you know, whatever the regulation was she was thinking about at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, for example, you know, we might discuss, uh, you know, how are we monitoring, you know, the temperature and humidity in the department or, what, you know, how are we monitoring the, you know, the, uh, quality of our washers or what are we doing for education or, you know, all those sorts of things, you know, whatever it was that, you know, she was concerned about, uh, she would just come to me and talk about it. And of course, you know, that's when we get began to be able to share expertise. And that's when I began to realize that sterile processing really had a lot to offer to uh, the hospital by and large. You know, uh, she would begin to ask me what I thought about you know, high-level disinfection that was going on in radiology uh, regarding, you know, vaginal ultrasound probes. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, that was an area that was very much outside of my purview at the time, but yet I found out that the things that I knew from my sterile processing actually applied quite a bit. Oh, that's great. So in those those relationships with your IP team, across multiple facilities now, as a leader, you know, pulling yourself out of that situation, looking back in, what are some barriers between those two teams? So you talk a little bit about expertise and sharing that uh, information. What are some uh, uh, focus points maybe that other sterile processing leaders can be considering as they try to build their own? So it sounds like you kind of add um, – have it handed to you, if you will, have them knocking on your door. But a lot of us in the industry, we're the ones having to track down these teams and, and begin building these relationships. How how are we to fill about the barriers? How are we to overcome them and build the, uh, the partnership that it sounds like you created down there? Yeah, so, uh, you know, like I said, I, I had a tremendous advantage that a lot of people I know uh, have not been given. And so, in retrospect, you know, I kind of thought, you know, you know, if I had to build this again from the ground up, how would I do it? Uh, and I've talked with some other um, infection preventionists. In fact, I've become, you know, somewhat active in uh, APIC in Arkansas. In fact, I yeah, you know, I was a, a keynote speaker at their fall conference. I'm going to be a keynote speaker again this uh, this coming fall for another one of their conferences. And I, I kind of realized that there's a there's a big hunger in the IP community for information regarding medical device reprocessing, just in general. 
And what I've realized is, is that, you know, probably one of the biggest barriers is IPs just simply don't know what they don't know. Uh, the, the IP that I worked with, it, you know, here in Conway, uh, you know, she was at least aware of regulations and, you know, some of the standards that were involved in, you know, the reprocessing field. But I've talked to a lot of IPs who really feel like they're just completely lost when it comes to reprocessing. You know, they don't know this, you know, sort of, you know, the stuff that we take for granted, uh, like your ST79 and all that sort of stuff. And when you start looking at who actually are the IPs and, and where, what are their career backgrounds, you'll realize that, that many of them are, you know, nurses. Uh, some of them have come from like the laboratory. Uh, very few have any background in the OR itself. So, you know, concepts of clean and dirty might seem, you know, pretty simple to them. But when you add in the third field, which is the sterile, uh, honestly, they get kind of lost. Mm. Uh, and I think that as a result, they they tend to focus on what they know. And what they know is whatever field they came from. So if they were, you know, if they got their training originally as, you know, a med surge nurse or something like that, that's where they're going to put all their focus. And they're going to focus on those things because that's where they're comfortable. But no IP, or so I would say no, but very few IPs have very little uh, training, uh, regarding things in the OR and high level disinfection. Uh, and so, you know, it's, again, it goes back to, you know, they don't really know what they don't know. Yeah. And so that gives SPD a chance to kind of reach across the aisle and say, Hey, you know, come, come, come with us, you know, show, let us show you what, what we do and how we play a part in, you know, this, you know, battle against hospital acquired infections. It's so interesting that you say that, Mike, because before we got on the air and, and Hank and I were talking and preparing a little bit, he pointed out an article that he wrote in June of last year uh, for Infection Control Today. And the thing that really stuck out to me when we were talking was the fact that I'm, my background is as a nurse, too, and I've run into a lot of IPs as well and, and began to get involved in uh, APIC chapters and doing education, and I found the same thing that you just said. A lot of them did not come from OR or sterile processing, and I wondered, just as a follow-up to what you're saying, seems like they could be a real partner in lending credibility to the sterile processing team, not just the manager but the entire team, by being a partner and advocating to the OR and even materials management when it comes time to talk about equipment and purchases and the types of support that you need to do your job effectively, seems like they can really lend credibility and enhance the perception of sterile processing as an expert in their field. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with you, and I think that's probably one of the areas of most untapped uh, potential in the battle uh, that we, that we kind of face in the industry right now for, you know, increased visibility and increased, uh, you know, education and, uh, just advocacy with, you know, the C-suite or who, whomever, uh, is, you know, APIC and infection preventionists just as a whole. Because, uh, when you start talking about very simple, uh, behind the scenes things that make a huge difference in people's lives, you know, those are the kinds of things that speak to, to infection preventionists. You know, uh, I always joke that, you know, SPD and, and IPs have a lot in common, you know, in that, you know, we could save somebody's life, but you will never, you know, get one of those, uh, you know, thank you cards from a patient that says, you know, thank you for making my instrument sterile or, you know, thank you for making sure the nurses know to, you know, do hand hygiene on their way in and out of the rooms. You know, both are committed to those very behind the scenes, very uh, unnoticed actions that have the dramatic potential for affecting uh, people's lives. And as a result, you know, like you said, APIC has tremendous credibility. Uh, anybody who's been through any sort of either, you know, CMS inspection or state health inspection, joint commission, 
you know, any of those regulatory bodies, you know, the first person they typically come and talk to is the infection preventionist. Uh, and so infection prevention just as a field has a tremendous amount of respect with regulatory agencies and by necessity that kind of forces the administration to have a tremendous amount of respect and to lean on them uh, for their advice. And so, you know, that is an easy, easy avenue to start directing some of that attention to the sterile processing department, which otherwise, I mean, for the most part, tends to be completely out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, Mike, you're exactly right. When CMS or Joint Commission hit the front door, who do they call? <laughs> Infection prevention. They're at their side Absolutely. from the beginning, you know, first day to the last uh, to report out. And what better team to have in your corner and familiar with your processes uh, than that team to be speaking into the ear of the surveyors throughout the process, if they're in the OR, if they're on the floor, um, that t- even having that shared language across these disciplines, huge benefit when it comes down to those surveys. And as you mentioned as well, um, a lot of these teams have the ear of the C-suite in a way that many sterile processing departments just would not have of their own accord. Um, it, it is related to... Uh, to quality, to reimbursement, to all manner of measurable uh, metrics out there. So it, it's, you know, from the sterile processing side, a very helpful, very beneficial relationship uh, for a number of reasons. Um, yeah, so let absolutely. Me, let me make a little transition here then with all of that being understood, so the huge impact that you can have on increased increasing quality across the board in terms of surgical services. Uh, On the sterile processing side, so looking internally into our department, what's the biggest challenge that you see for our teams to build this model that thinks and cares about infections and and that data that your IP team would be looking at? Because I'll speak from my perspective, many leaders out there, in sterile processing, we're thinking, is the tray there? Do we have enough? Is a case card stopped? Are the doctors happy? Uh, there's not a lot of looking down the pipe to the future a week or two, a month out to say, did these patients who maybe their room started on time, maybe there were no issues with the case card, but they developed a surgical site infection. Um how do we inculcate that in our frontline staff all the way up through sterile processing leadership to have a, a model that focuses on the importance of infection? Sure. So, you know, sterile processing is just a different animal, you know, within the hospital environment as a whole. So we have to think about things in some ways very much kind of like how you would think of a factory. You know, you have your, your raw material, which in our case is, you know, contaminated instruments, and you have your process that adds value, and then you spit out your final product, which is sterile instruments, right? So, you know, and that's kind of when you, when you start thinking about things like that, you know, that's very useful for a lot of different reasons, uh, and that can be a very useful way to look at sterile processing. And But we have to be very careful that in the process of looking at it is as essentially, you know, a, a product throughput, we don't also forget that we are essentially a clinical posi- position as well. Hmm. Uh, you know, so, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, who we are as, you know, sterile processing leaders. You know, so many of us and myself, and I know you included, uh, you know, we were not ever clinically trained. Uh, we are technicians by, by nature, and we, that's how we distinguished ourselves as just being really good at the technical side of what we do. And so things like microbiology are just simply not where we are strong. Uh, and that's again goes back to the IP, you know, connection that, you know, I can, I can spit out throughput and, efficiency numbers and all those sorts of things. But, 
you know, my, one of my best resources to get, you know, the, the microbiological side of things, uh, comes from the, those who are trained to think about infections in that sort of way. And if you put the two together, uh, I think that's the only way you're going to ever be able to look at SPD, you know, holistically. Okay, great. Well, so you mentioned in that answer the clinical perspective. Are we clinical or are we not? We're not at the bedside. We don't see the patient. But in one sense, we are more clinical than 90% of other hospital staff in that our work product goes directly into the patient, into the sterile area. We are we're touching physically lungs and hearts and um, across the board. It, it does not get any more clinical than in the middle of a brain surgery. So to that perspective then, uh, we are technicians. We are responsible for the technical side of it. As clinicians um, in the healthcare space, why doesn't our compensation measure up to, for instance, maybe surgical techs who are at the bedside and they're using our tools that have been prepared and inspected and packaged and sterilized, but oftentimes they're getting paid five, ten, fifteen dollars more an hour. What's going on there in your mind? Yeah, so, I mean, I I totally agree with that entirely. And from our end, it's as leaders, it's one thing we have to acknowledge is that we have to be constantly reminding our staff of the, the clinical aspects because, you know, as a technician, it's very easy to get disconnected from what it is that you're doing. Uh, you know, for, from your perspective, all you know is, you know, clean sets out, dirty sets in. And you forget that in that interim in between is a person. Uh, you know, and as leaders, that's something that we have to be constantly, you know, reminding our staff about. But I mean, when you get down to the compensation debate, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, and I've even, uh, reminded, you know, in fact, I, I've been published actually saying this, that, uh, you know, one bad SPD tech can mess up more patients in one day than a bad surgeon can. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, you think about that, that, you know, a moderately productive day you may do, a technician may do, you know, let's just say 20 sets. Well, you know, that's probably 20 different people that that set's going to be used on. So if there's a flaw in that person's uh, understanding their training, their education, or, you know, their technique, any of those things can res- result in some pretty, you know, dramatic uh, results. And we've seen that uh, in our careers, and that's been documented uh, in a, several different places. So, you know, it's difficult uh, to really a- adequately address the compensation issue and, you know, the time that we're going to have because there's so many things going on there. And I think that it's very related to this conversation, I should say, uh, the thing that we, sh- we can begin to, to lean on is the fact that as, you know, the more clinical side of things with the IP side, uh, who, you know, and they, the IPs tend to have, like we said earlier, the ears of the C-suite, you know, they could be a great advocate to direct the attention of the C-suite, the people who actually make the decisions on what we get paid to our staff to say, hey, you know, there actually is a lot of risk based on what these, you know, people are doing and we're paying them, you know, peanuts, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or you know, their turnover rate is incredibly high and in that, that when an IP says, I have a concern, you know, typically your, your C-suite people begin to listen. Whereas, you know, it, it, me as a manager of SPD, when I say, hey, my SPD techs don't make enough money, you know, I, I don't, I think their eyes kind of glaze all over because, you know, number one, I'm not an, I'm not an objective, uh, party in this. You know, I want my people to get paid. But then number two, uh, you know, on top of that, I, I can't really, 
communicate what clinically, you know, patient specific uh, is at risk nearly as well and with as much credibility as what my IP counterpart can. You know, Mike, you bring up some really good points there, especially, you know, I'm thinking from a hospital administrator standpoint, when you start talking about raising the wages or, you know, starting and midpoint salaries for a certain role, it's really easy to just see the dollars, right? Well, how does that impact the budget, the squeeze, et cetera? And I think you're touching on how infection control might be able to make that case. Then the, then the question comes back and says, okay, well, we, we could allot the money, but do you want more people or do you want higher wages for the people that you have? And, you know, I can see that whole dance kind of going around there. You might have a department that's pretty well, you know, pretty understaffed. So then they're saying, yeah, well, how do you prioritize the need in that case? Do you, do you believe that people with higher wages will perform more efficiently than more people at a lower wage? I mean, yeah, I absolutely believe that. And I think that, uh, you know, I think there's several economic studies out there that, that say pretty similar things. You know, just throwing more bodies at a problem isn't necessarily the best thing when you really, what you really need are technically trained people, uh, who have been well, uh, you know, educated and trained for this, a specific job and, and have been hanging around long enough to where they have enough experience to, you know, know the problem spots and to know what to look for and look out for. Uh, you know, so I, I'm definitely a believer in quality over quantity when it comes to the technicians. Plus, you know, obviously a higher wage would have a tendency of drawing a more driven personality, uh, someone who is probably not going to be as content with just coming in, punching a clock, and then, you know, punching out and collecting a check at the end of the day. Uh, you know, of course, we're we're painting in broad strokes here, so I don't want to act. Uh, I don't want to seem like we're you know throwing everybody who makes a low wage under the bus, but I mean, reality is what it is. Uh, you know, a higher wage tends to bring a higher quality of worker. And I believe that higher quality of worker will result in a higher quality of outcome for, uh, for our patients and a higher level of safety for those patients. It seems, uh, but I mean, that does, I was going to say, it seems that you could be more selective and you probably could have higher expectations. Not that you can't set the same expectation today, but you do have to, you know, it's kind of like those smart goals, right? They have to be reasonable and they have to be attainable. And if you're able right. to be selective with staff, you might be able to set higher expectations in terms of productiv- productivity and efficiency metrics. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that does, honestly, you know, if you think about this from the C-suite's perspective, you know, like you brought up, I mean, it does bring up a very, you know, realistic, very real question, which is, uh, you know, how, how do we quantify what a high quality technician uh, is worth? And honestly, you know, that study just simply doesn't exist. And I, I really wish that it did. And I, I keep throwing this out there to the community, hoping that somebody's going to pick it up, because honestly, I wouldn't have the first clue where to start. But I think it's kind of one of those duh statements that all of us probably know to be true, uh, but no one's ever been able to say, you know, hey, if you invest in this technician, you pay them well, you train them well, you keep them, uh, you know, this is what they're going to make you in prevented SSIs, prevented negative outcomes. Uh, you know, I, I genuinely believe that if we ever were to get that number, whatever it may be, I really think that it would prove that SPD is one of the safest, uh, you know, investments that a, a C-suite could make uh, in their hospital. And I really think that that would change our industry. And, you know, I told a group of IPs just last week that I think that if we were ever, ever able to do that study, I, I, that administrations would just start throwing money at SPD because they would see the ROI. But what is the ROI right now? We we don't know. So, Mike, when you uh, speak of throwing money, uh, that is happening now, but the money's not being thrown in-house. It's often being thrown out to third parties who, interestingly <laughs> enough, have higher starting wages. They're able to 
to recruit and retain higher educated, certified uh, t- technicians who really become specialists at what they do, and they're they're basically guns for hire. Uh, yeah. And, and they come with a price tag. So the industry out there has been able to put a price tag on what quality is worth, and hospitals, many of them across the country, are paying it. Uh, the challenge, and this is why this conversation is so interesting to me and I think to a lot of um, to a lot of sterile processing leaders around the country, is as sterile processing professionals, we need data we need a language that can be communicated financially, quality-centered to the C-suite to um, also engage that same budget that those dollars are being competed against, you know, with higher qualified, higher trained, more experienced staff out there in the world waiting to get in to help us. That's why don't we invest some of that money, start on the front end in-house, um, so yeah, to make fantastic points there. Well, uh, so walking out from that, then um, we spoke a little bit about uh, about certification previously. How can working with these teams, even at the state level, as you said, with the APIC organizations, how can that collaboration impact this huge national certification debate that's going on? To my knowledge, there's only three or four states right now that require certification. There's a lot more to go, um, and the progress is just not happening. It's not happening very quickly. So, how can this, how can this relationship impact that? Well, you know, as I as I stated earlier, uh, you know, your your state health agencies and your regulatory agencies they tend to partner. Uh, very closely with your organizations like APIC. Uh, you know, they depend upon them. And in fact, uh, I know it, it, in our state, in Arkansas, the Arkansas State uh, Health Department and our local, you know, state APIC are, you know, just tightly intertwined. You know, so that kind of gives us an ally in that governmental area who gets uh, you know a lot of uh, cre- who carries a lot of credibility uh, with state legislators you know and this is one of my criticisms of our current strategy in trying to get certification mandated is we we tend to want to be sort of, sort of these lone wolves who you know try to go toe to toe against hospital associations who don't see the value and, you know, we fight them or we, you know, we bow to them or we try to avoid them when I think the, the soundest strategy is to win them over. And so in order to do that, we need as many high level allies as we can possibly get. And I think that one of the, you know, surefire, you know, easiest allies to get on our side uh, is the, is the state APIC chapters and by extension, you know, through those APIC chapters, you can easily move into your state health organizations. And when state health organizations start saying, you know, hey, this is something we should really start looking at, that's when, you know, your hospital associations will also start taking notice as well. Uh, so, you know, again, I say, you know, why fight them when you can win them over? No, that's great. Well, so as a sterile processing professional who's listening out there and says, okay, uh, I get what you're throwing down there. We, we've got to have some collaboration across the aisle um, with multiple disciplines and hospitals that realize the value of high-quality surgical instrument processing. Um, how do I get involved? Where do I go to to track down my local APIC chapter? Is it free to join? Is it free to go to the meetings? What does that look like in a practical sense? Sure. So, I mean, I would say, listen, if you're a sterile processing professional, even, you know, if you're a manager, uh, supervisor, technician, you know, whatever it is, you need to go meet your IP team. You know, whether it's one person or if it's multiple people, whoever it is, you need to go meet them. You need to go talk to them, even if it's nothing more to say, hey, you know, this is who I am. You know, I, I want us to work together. I would love for any sort of information you can give me. 
you know, to, to begin to establish those relationships, uh, at the, at the local hospital level. And, you know, uh, I'm not actually sure, honestly, what the, uh, the membership requirements look like for APIC itself. Uh, but I know that most chapters have at least, uh, one or two big meetings a year. Uh, you know, our local one has journal club meetings where, you know, we get together and discuss, uh, uh, you know, uh, peer reviewed journals on, you know, uh, infections and prevention and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, hospital acquired infections. You know, I've done a couple myself. I did one, uh, just recently on where we just kind of looked at the, you know, report on uh, the, I believe it was 2009 outbreak of arthroscopy uh, uh, infections at Houston Methodist, you know, sort of a well-known uh, outbreak. And we just kind of looked at it and we used that to uh, raise awareness of, you know, something, you know, seemingly, you know, a low risk surgery that kind of blew up and became a disaster. Well, that's something that you know, uh, infection preventionists, you know, take notice of, and that's a great way to get your foot in the door and say, hey, uh, that's something that I can be involved with, uh, and that's something that I can do to talk about what, you know, uh, where we are. And, you know, along those same lines, you know, when we're back to the the compensation question, uh, one thing that we haven't really discussed is uh, the career ladder. And uh, the reason I bring it up is that most people don't realize that although most hospital infection preventionists are nurses, there's actually nothing that says that they have to be nurses. And so you'll find that there are many uh, infection preventionists who are uh, who come from different fields, uh, many of whom seem to come from the lab for uh, whatever reason. But through my talks with other infection preventionists and even our systems epidemiologists, we realized that there's actually a pretty, you know, nice avenue for uh, potential SPD techs to move into infection prevention. Uh, you know, if you look at what all an infection preventionist does, uh, you know, SPD, just the basic core concept of, you know, you've got contaminated, clean, and sterile, and we got to keep them all separated, and we have to do the proper things to move them through those stages. Uh, that's like 25% of what it takes to be an infection preventionist, and that's what SPD techs do every day. Uh, so, you know, if you go to your IPs and say, hey, I'm interested in growing in my knowledge of how what I do affects those patients, uh, I would be – I'd say you're going to be hard pressed to find an IP who won't jump at that chance. So Mike, you've done something um, that I respect and I think a lot of sterile processing leaders out there who are looking at themselves and saying, okay, how can I get invited to present to my statewide APIC organization? How can I do education to try to bridge that gap of, of knowledge and understanding um, and what you've done is when you're asking how do you get a seat at the table, in one sense you built your own chair. Um, you began, you know, submitting um, articles to publications like Infection Control Today and intentionally reaching out into that world, into that space, um, not with anything high academic uh, in terms of research, but just common sense we have got some challenges that have have to be addressed in sterile processing. We got compensation challenges, education challenges, process challenges, recruitment and retention. And in doing that, I think that was that's one of the reasons that your profile began to raise in those circles. Um, and so, for leaders out there, I can say from my own experience, there's not a lot of us inside sterile processing who are writing and engaging and trying to get these ideas and these questions out um, to the folks who they would help us if they knew um, what we needed and how would it 
it would improve all of surgical services. So uh, I applaud you for doing that, and I just want to, if you have not realized that yourself, uh, to, you know, throw that out there, that it's, I can see that impact of the steps that you took to um, equip yourself and also brand yourself as a sterile processing leader who um, is willing to become educated and then be an asset, you know, for both teams. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate that. You know, I, and I would just, uh, you know, like to say that, you know, all of this does kind of go back to the compensation question because when we talk about the fact that, you know, there's not a lot of people out there who are, you know, writing or engaging with the larger community, uh, you know, uh, we we have to be honest and say, you know, a large part of that is because a lot of the people who could who have the potential to do that, uh, you know, they probably left and went to some other service. Uh, they're, they're working somewhere else now, uh, because the compensation simply could not keep them where they were. Uh, and you know, in some ways that's, that's benefited some of us by, uh, creating some opportunities, uh, from a significant leadership gap, but we also have to acknowledge that you know, that gap is there for a reason. And so, you know, we're going to, those of us who are here, we're going to do our best to to fill that gap as much as we can. But, you know, I, I have to say that this wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be here probably having this comp- conversation right now uh, if it weren't for the fact that, you know, those, a lot of those people who are probably, you know, better communicators, better writers, better speakers, probably, you know, more academically focused, you know, they, they just simply weren't able to stick around because, uh, you know, they have families and someone's got to pay them. You know, Mike, you make such a fantastic point about building a career and stating there's a place where you can go potentially in infection control and, and grow your career to that point. Sometimes it's hard to attract a high quality technician, as you had said earlier, just because so many people, even surgical techs that sometimes start in, in sterile processing feel like it's either A, a stepping stone to the OR, so there's career ladder, or some people feel like, well, where am I going to go from there? And when people are mm-hmm. building a resume and building a career, there needs to be a vision. There needs to be a plan. There needs to be something that entices them to go a little above and beyond. And so maybe if more people see something as big picture as you just kind of mentioned that way, that they put in that effort. And then I know you said there's sort of some collateral. There's there's damage because they wind up leaving you at, and they were so good. And the compensation just doesn't justify that they're excelling in their career. They need to grow and they need to grow beyond the department. But then on the other hand, there's sort of like this collateral positive where they go throughout the organization and raise that profile. And if we did have those data metrics like we talked about earlier as well, that would sort of show that these people are not only high performers, but what that does for the department, it might wind up circling back around and supporting the argument for higher wages and saying, look, we're developing leaders in this organization, in this department. That's not happening by accident. It's happening Mm -hmm. intentionally. And it should also raise the profile of, wait a second, We should not be losing those leaders. We should be keeping them in this department as well and enticing, uh, the ability to grab more people from the, from the outlying community who are job seekers, maybe people coming right out of college because if they know they can make a decent wage to start and they also know there's a career path, this is no longer, you know, in the basement. This is, this is how you grow within the organization. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, honestly, that that goes right back to, you know, what Hank mentioned earlier, where we're seeing the growth of the third-party company who's coming in and, you know, essentially doing what you just said. You know, they come in, they train people better, they pay them better up front, but then they also, since they're, they're part of a larger organization, those who distinguish themselves get the opportunity to, become, you know, move up within that organization. So, you know, for example, uh, you know, one of the growing ones is, is Stryker ProCare Onsite, uh, 
uh, you know, those guys who start out as SPD techs within that system, you know, they can distinguish themselves and, you know, they, they become ambitious and they, they, you know, uh, want to, you know, move up within that, that organization and become, you know, reps or, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, however they, they can through that organization, just having that avenue, uh, it attracts somebody who wants to excel. Well, and Mike, the, the burden of some of that career ladder, not all of us, you know, stumble into a career with a clear end in sight or a, a clear job that we want to have in five or 10 years. So, um, as we develop the leaders who will follow in our shadows to lead sterile processing departments, one of those burdens is uh, to lay out those options for our technicians, our frontline technicians, and say, listen, today I cannot give you a raise. In three, four, or five years, you can be prepared to take a position here, here, and here, with infection control, surgical technologist, out in the world of third party, but um, that roadmap has got to go through the certification track. That is the only today. That's the only distinguishing um, you know factor between a technician that has ten years um, at that so and so facility or a technician who has two or three years, but has maxed out every industry certification that's available to them. Uh, and, and that's where you start to see this very quick growth um, through even the the internal sterile processing career ladder from technician to supervisor to manager to director. Uh, we have been able, we have been seeing this across the country now. Uh, so you have folks coming in off the street, no prior sterile processing knowledge. They hit the books, they hit the certification, they get the experience. In two, three years, they're a manager. Four or five years, they're a director. And they've gone, as you said, from making peanuts now to making a living wage and hopefully being able to make a difference in an industry that is just yearning for leaders. So um, it's been good to capture this conversation in a context of infection control, but I just want to say that is a broader career ladder Um that leaders should be pushing for their technicians. Sure, and I, and I would say that in addition to that, uh, you know, we we really do need the, the ability to not just uh, you know push our people up the career ladder and then out of the department. Uh, you know, there needs to be room for and compensation to make it possible for that employee who just loves being a technician. Yeah. Uh, you know, and who, who wants to do that long term, doesn't want to go to management, just loves doing what they do. You know, I've got one of those techs that works for me now, and I can tell you that, you know, hands down, that's the best, one of the best technicians I've ever worked with. And the truth of the matter is she could go you know, do whatever she wanted to, uh, but she just loves being a tech. And, uh, you know, I really think that in addition to our career ladders, we need to have room for those people. Uh, to to earn a living wage as well. Yeah, management style also just engaging people and giving them added responsibility. You make a really good point. Not everybody wants to necessarily climb a ladder, but they know they want to feel like they're being productive and that they're contributing what they have to give on the job. And people are more satisfied on a day to day basis that way. And that helps with culture yeah. and attitude of all the people that work in the department around you. And it's, it's so very important. And I was just realizing as we were talking about this, and I can't believe I didn't think of it before, but the sterile processing manager at the hospital in my hometown actually recently in the last year moved into an infection control position. And I know right. of another one, uh, in the Geisinger Health System in, uh, central, kind of central Pennsylvania, where as that system grew, the need for additional infection control, um, experience and also not a clinician historically, but somebody who was certified, 
and wound up moving into an infection control position as that got bigger and bigger. And the part I was going to also make is if people are moving into roles, especially with a conglomeration that's going on in the industry right now, they're moving into to larger and larger roles. Think about how many high-performing technicians became frustrated because they knew that that manager slot was never going to open up because the person who was in it had been there forever and wasn't going anywhere. And I can also mm-hmm. feel how that might be sort of frustrating. So if the if the organization on the whole sort of supports that, just think about how that impacts culture and attitude on a day-to-day basis. People tend to feel, I think, a little more intrinsically motivated and rewarded on on uh, as far as their contribution to any organization that way. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on all that. And it's really, I'm glad to see that, you know, uh, it's not just an isolated incident where, uh, you know, there's where you're seeing sterile processing uh, professionals moving into that IP role because it is kind of a natural fit. And I'm glad to hear that that is happening, you know, at other places as well. So, Mike, before we close it out here, I did want to spend a little bit of time specifically tying in the place of infection prevention with our sterile processing vendors. So our departments are equipment-driven departments. They're product-driven departments. Um, You can make or break, even with the best staff out there, a department with a a sterilizer that's constantly failing or with not enough instrumentation or or perhaps the wrong cleaning agents or insufficient cleaning agents. Um, As a leader who has to justify every penny, um, we know that having that advocate again in infection prevention to advocate for those dollars and uh, the the realization that this sterilizer or this caught washer is at the end of life. Um, how would you speak to vendors? Number one, you can start there for how they should build relationships with the IP team and why. And then number two, how can we as sterile processing leaders help ask the right questions of our vendors to give that justification to IP and and to administration to get the stuff that we need, um, not just because it's new and it's faster, but actually because it's safer. Yeah, so, you know, that, that kind of brings in sort of a larger, you know, issue that we that we probably all experientially, you know, seen in our careers where, you know, the OR buys this nice, shiny new piece of equipment and then, you know, they come down, they shove it in your lap and, and you say, you know, okay, how am I supposed to clean this? And they kind of shrug their shoulders and say, just do whatever you do, you know, and, and I've, I've been in that situation and it's, it's really kind of crazy when you, you go to them and you say, Hey, by the way, if you had read the IFUs, you would know that we don't have the proper equipment to clean this device. And so that's when, you know, their heads start to spin around and, you know, that's just not a good situation. So it's really interesting that, you know, when it comes to, you know, equipment purchases, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, or, you know, uh, how you actually clean it, uh, is an afterthought rather than one of the primary concerns. So that's, you know, when you talk about equipment coming from the OR, you're thinking, you know, I'm thinking like surgical instruments or th- th- those sorts of things, you know, particularly, uh, Da Vinci arms are kind of the, the, big focus right now larger scale though when you're talking about you know the equipment that's actually in your department that you use to clean these sorts of things like you know so your da vinci arms if you need a a really nice new you know automated reprocessor that will do a lot of the steps for you uh you know it's hard to get the clearance to purchase those things uh, just on your own because, you know, your, your OR director or whoever it is that's holding the, the strings to your budget might just say, well, you know, why do you even do, need this? Can't you just clean it by hand? Mm-hmm. Um, that's when your IP can come in and be extremely effective. Uh, so, you know, IPs 
can very quickly pick up on the necessity of following the IFU. So, uh, you know, the IFU states clearly, you know, that you need X, you know, whatever that cleaning chemical or whatever that cleaning piece of equipment is, you know, that and, and your OR director doesn't really want to pay for it. You know, your, your IP is a great resource to say, you know, Hey, our regulations require us to follow this. And yes, you are going to buy this. Again, they have significant pull in the, the hospital hierarchy. And so that's something that they really do have the ability to, to, uh, to do. And just as, as an aside, I would like to say that, you know, there are a lot of, uh, managers or even technicians who know that a practice or may not be adequate or you may just be flat out wrong that's going on in their department, but they feel very isolated on how are they going to, you know, fix this because they can't fix it themselves. You know, I've actually had this conversation on our link in our LinkedIn community. You know, uh, a technician would say, you know, help. I, I know something's going on that isn't right. You know, an IFU is not being followed or we're reprocessing this in a way that we're not supposed to be, or we're reprocessing something that shouldn't be reprocessed at all. You know, my, you know, my higher ups don't want to listen to me. Who should I talk to? What should I do? And I, my response is always the same. Go to your IP. Uh, because I guarantee you that, that, uh, that mantra of follow your IFU is something that they can understand very well. And if, if you can go to them and tell them how that practice is not being uh, fulfilled or maybe not being fulfilled as well. That's something that's going to speak to them, uh, very, very much so. And so I think that, you know, they can very quickly become your advocates, uh, when you see a, a process that is failing. That is great advice. And the IFU piece, what you said before about vendors making that their first stop is, is educating on the new device and how to clean it and that attention isn't always paid to that. And we talk a lot about education and we're, I think it's important to know that education isn't just certification with our technicians. It's educating the organization and people outside of the department. But then also I wanted to ask you as far as education for the vendors, like the certification through ISHM, the CCSVP, how much weight does that carry in both of your eyes and how many vendors do you think coming into your department on a daily basis supporting your institutions have that certification? I mean, I can only speak from my experience. Uh, I have had, uh, of, and I'm probably not the best person to ask this because I have not had very good uh uh, involvement from my reps. I've had very little success trying to get traction uh, from them on uh, doing anything of that nature. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to gracefully bow out to this one for, for Hank, because I think he's had a little bit more success than I have. Well, so uh, I appreciate that, Mike, and I, I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit. One of the things that just talking about certification in general gives a perfect platform then when you have a vendor in your department who's giving you an in-service and your technicians are asking questions of that manufacturer's IFUs. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've had uh, the salesman with a deer in the headlights look of, well, no one's ever asked me if you can sterilize it in under these parameters or no one's ever asked me what chemicals can I use or what's the pH level that's approved for it. As your staff and your facility increase their own certification mindset, it, it really puts those vendors in a position to where if they want credibility with you, um, they have got to take that step. And it's not a big step. Now, granted, it is uh, a decent-sized textbook. Uh, I think the requirements are something like 40 hours in two different facilities, Um that they would have to spend hands-on time viewing and um, just time in departments to learn those processes. But the from the industry perspective, I think that is of 
huge and paramount importance um, simply because a lot of these guys and gals, they're not coming even from clinical backgrounds themselves. They're, uh, they have previous sales experience. I know one of my old representatives um, are in a territory that I was in. They hired a new rep um, to sell sterilization equipment, big sterilizers, and his background was with American Express. Now, could he sell? Probably so. Uh, did he have the foundational knowledge to really speak into a, a department to identify the infection control challenges there and give us solutions that are tailor-made for our purpose, which is safe patient care? Probably not. If he would have walked in my office, though, with the vendor certification and say, listen, I have... I've done my time, I've learned the basics, uh, and I just want to demonstrate to you that I care about what your job is and how you do it and why you do it. Um, it, it does carry weight. So one of the things that I would recommend a manager do, if you have approval from your supply chain and your administrators, make it a line in the sand. I'm not doing business with any vendor who does not have certification. <laughs> I, I, I've had that conversation over the past few months, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, it does work. So, um, You know, Hank, you're making an awesome point. If we're pushing certification all across the states for sterile processing technicians, it's really not that much of a leap to say that the vendor should also have some sort of certification that – it allows them to support, you know, devices with sterile processing. It just, it, it makes a lot of logical sense. Yeah, and what's interesting as well, as we talk about career ladders, a lot of our technicians, our high-performing, educated, certified technicians um, are getting hired outside by these vendors in these sales roles, and they're a fantastic fit because they do have that insider knowledge. Uh, they're able to walk into a department and quickly see uh, that there's opportunity here, not necessarily just to make a sale, but there's opportunity here to provide better patient care or to increase efficiency for this workflow. And some of those things you just can't learn by being in the field, you've got to learn by being inside that department. So, Mike, as we kind of wrap up the interview, we're coming up on an hour here. That's typically a good length for a podcast. But is there anything that we didn't talk about, or do you want to follow up on Hank's point there about certification specifically? Because I know education was a big focus for the interview, and we talked about it, but we really never focused on certification specifically, CRCST, CCSVP. Uh, we just kind of talked about it just now. I, I, I have a feeling you have maybe some things you want to add there. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, we talked about it briefly, uh, you know, just about the, the state the requiring possibly through the states. Uh, is there any particular avenue you're looking for? So, so Mike, uh, if you could talk a little bit about that multiple certification uh, opportunity, you know, so these states and the legislation that's coming down in them, they're a baseline entry level one standard industry certification, but that's that's the bottom. That's the lowest standard, the, the lowest common denominator. Um, so why would you encourage technicians or leaders out there to pursue additional certification and credentials? And is that something that you think we should be writing into job descriptions um, as it pertains to career ladders? So, uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, and that's one thing. First off, speaking about how, you know, exactly what you said, that, you know, the – when we talk about certification, we're talking about, you know, the basic minimum, you know, nationally standardized uh, form of, of training. And if you look at the numbers, you know, I, I talk about this in, in my talks that I give to, you know, APIC or whoever that, you know, BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, says there's about 50,000, you know, medical device reprocessors 
in the country. And if you look at the numbers from, uh, you know, Isham, you're talking about, you know, I think it's last time I looked, I think it's like 22,000, 23,000 CRCSTs. Uh, and I, I can't remember what the, uh, the other number is, but, uh, you know, the point is we're, we're hanging out about half, uh, half of the possible, uh, reprocessors that are out there have some form of basic certification. And most people, when they hear that, they say, you know, okay, that's half. That's, that's not too bad. We're, do, we're doing okay there. Uh, but, you know, I kind of say, you know, play this scenario through your head. You go to a hospital and they say, you know, listen, we're going to have to admit you to the hospital, but don't worry. We're going to take really good care of you. You know, we're, you know, in fact, you don't have to worry about anything because half of our doctors have their license, you know, (laughs) or, you know, half of our nurses actually went to school to be nurses. You know, like there in no way do you feel good about that if you're the one who's going to be on the receiving end of that kind of care. So, you know, number one, we're 50 percent is not a good number. Uh, we, that number, there's really just no reason for it not to be 100%. Now, g- moving forward from that, like I said, that's just kind of the basic, uh, standardization. If you look at how many people have a more advanced certification, uh, the numbers combined for, uh, the certified instrumentation specialist and certified in healthcare leadership, uh, tally out to, I believe, less than 4,000. So you're talking about within, you know, two certifications, you're already in the top 10% in your industry in the country, or actually really the world because that's an international organization. So, you know, that sounds really amazing on a resume. Uh, so you can very quickly distinguish yourself from your peers just by getting a second certification. And, you know, you know, if you really want to knock it out of the park and you get three and, you know, uh, Hank's, you know, former, you know, hospital cr- uh, coined the term triple crown. You know, if you want to be a triple crown, you know, uh, you're in the top 300, you know, 300, 350 sterile processing professionals, you know, in the world. And there isn't a hiring manager on the planet who wouldn't love the sound of that. Uh, and, and I'll just tell you, just to be perfectly honest, I have gotten a lot of mileage out of just knowing that number. Uh, you can very quickly distinguish yourself with one of those uh, more advanced certifications. Those numbers are beautiful, and I love I love you sharing it with the listening audience because that is a great point. With two certifications, you're in the top 10%. Imagine sitting in front of a sterile processing manager who doesn't know those statistics and laying that out there for a job that you want, or maybe you are somebody in the department that's looking at a lead tech or supervisory role, and you've already done that. To characterize your interest and how you stand out, is incredibly valuable. Mike, I can't tell you how appreciative I am and, and Hank as well for you coming on, uh, for our first show. I think we did a pretty good job. You were an absolute fantastic guest. Obviously incredibly knowledgeable, but some real, I think, tips and real world advice for people growing in their sterile processing professions today. Well, thanks. It was a lot of fun. I feel like we could have talked for a lot longer. Uh, you know, this is, you know, a, a, a very important thing. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I could talk about it for a lot longer if we needed to. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, this isn't going to be the last show and there's no reason we can't have you on again. And I think that'll be by far, you know, just based on how this interview went, 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 I think, I think we will have you on again. What do you think, Hank? I'm all for it. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Michael Matthews, everybody, manager of Central Sterile at Baptist Health in Arkansas. Hank, a couple of really good points, but I got to tell you, you did, uh, you, you really hit a home run in securing our first guest for the show. Yeah, wasn't it great? I, I mean, awesome credentials. A, as we mentioned, 
uh, before he's a rising star in an industry that's just hungry for some leadership out there and some thought leadership. So I thought he did a great job. Yeah, you know, one of the points that he made that I thought was really a good one, and maybe it's more of a food for thought in terms of how do you determine the value of a high-quality technician. We talked about Mm -hmm. more bodies versus higher wages versus career ladder, but I thought if you really just summarize that, it's it's we need the data. We need some way to to determine that value because you want to encourage the high performers in your department to continue on that path. That's right, and the challenge there, and he kind of he mentioned it as well, is there is very few industry standards today on what that looks like. So um, he laid down a, a, a challenge, if you will, to get some infection-centered data and research out there. I think I'll lay down the same challenge to say we need um, some good benchmarks related to quality and efficiency for sterile processing technicians and departments to compare themselves to each other uh, and begin driving that forward. I think the other thing that stood out to me, too, was the career ladder conversation, but specifically looking at other opportunities in the organization that don't necessarily require some sort of a degree or additional certification that might be more off the beaten path from what you're doing in sterile processing. What a great connection to IP, infection control, working there. Like he said, nothing says you have to be like a registered nurse to perform in that position. A lot of people come from the lab, and that really could be the next stop on the career path for many high-performing sterile processing technicians. I never even really thought of that, even though, as I mentioned, there were two people I knew very well that had gone from (laughs) manager positions to infection control positions within the last year. So it clearly is is, uh, not only achievable and doable, but it's it's something that people are doing right now as we speak. Yeah, you're exactly right, and the – I think what Mike brought forward very helpfully is um, in the same way that no man is an island, no department is an island, especially in a hospital setting. There's so much inter- interplay between there. Our, uh, our products, our instruments, you know, go to the OR. They touch many different teams in the OR. They come back to us again. Um, there's interactions with biomed, with materials, with infection prevention, and not becoming captives to our special team uh, and, and having that specific vision of only our department, only in the basement, that's all that we care about, but broadening that out and the data that we care about, but then, as you said, also in uh, in, the pr- in the career progression opportunities. And I think a big part of that are these outside groups, such as APIC or uh, our groups with materials management, for instance, I would encourage leaders and technicians who want to grow, who want to learn, and and even just be better sterile processing leaders uh, to engage with these groups to learn what they care about and how to use that language also to help our team. So uh, it's a fantastic time with the mic. I had a lot of good takeaways myself, so we're looking forward to definitely having him back sometime. Yeah, and and finally, like his whole – Conversation. Well, you said something that resonated with me, and I know we referenced an article that you wrote for Infection Control today. But you said, you know, how do you engage the the uh, the IP professional? How do you get a seat at the table? And you said, build your own chair. And I think exactly what you mentioned. You know, write articles, go to the, get involved in other chapters. Uh, you know, outside of just the, the Isham chapter that may be happening locally. And another thought that occurred to me that we didn't talk about, but it's another, as we're kind of brainstorming and throwing out ways to engage is why not have a combined meeting between your Isham and your APIC chapter on right. a sterile processing OR or device related issue of today because there's no reason you couldn't have somebody come and speak and issue CEUs that would be applicable to both organizations and also use the opportunity to network and bridge that gap. Yeah, and that's a big, uh, that's a hot opportunity right now, too. People just love getting together around education, around improvement, 
when you get these teams, you know, such as APIC and Isham and AORN, um, those folks are great at what they do and what their focus is. And when you get them all in the same room talking about the same topic, you know, such as equipment related challenges, uh, there's only good that can come of it. Only better understanding across the aisle, uh, only more confidence, um, on the technician level, even as Mike referenced, one of the things that I'm taking away is, uh, as a frontline technician or as a sterile processing manager, you should not be afraid to raise your hand and say, I have a concern. It, it, if you are, I hope you know now and are encouraged, you have a team that is tailor-made to get in your corner and help you fight the good fight to have safe patient care. So, um, I was definitely encouraged by that, and hopefully our listeners were as well. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We certainly would appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to us, especially as we build this podcast out and provide more content. We want to make sure we're talking about the hot topics of today that you want to hear from us. Thank you again for listening to our first edition of Beyond Clean.